Okay, uh, so I'm happy to be here to speak. Thanks, Abhishek, for bringing us here in this nice place. So this is work on uh, slow thermalization in classical systems, or classical Hamiltonian system. Uh, this is work not completely finished, but close to with uh, Yanni Lukarinan from University of Helsinki. He's here. So what, what are the, the sort of uh, motivation behind? Well, first of all is to find sort of a new example of a system where you have what I would call astonishingly small or slow thermalization. And astonishingly means that uh, it would be slower than what you could guess from, I don't know, some dimensional analysis or some theory that you know and you take it. And in fact, it's, it's much slower than the expectation from that, right? Um, and it's somehow in the similar spirit, for example, as the tool by one way uh, yesterday, where he had a very, very long uh, pre thermal plateau, uh, or if you wish, the tool by uh, Arnav Das, uh, which has also something which is very, very long lived, uh, needs sort of an explanation for things that are so long lived. Uh, second idea was that, okay, we could apply, uh, so that we had a lot of ideas that we developed for quantum systems, and we thought, okay, maybe we could apply them to classical system too. I don't think there is anything very deep from moving to the quantum to the classical, but nevertheless, some ideas developed for quantum one uh, typically use that things are quantized. They look at some, sometimes you, you need that in an essential way. So, and for that reason, a bit surprising that it can still work in the classical, classical set of rules. Okay. And then the third motivation is that uh, in some regimes, so uh, a theory that, that is good to understand thermalization is the so-called kinetic theory. And uh, it is part of an effort to develop something which is similar to kinetic theory in context where the, the, the classical kinetic theory does not apply. So it is, if you wish, a bit in the same spirit as was Marcus Rigol uh, was presenting, um, um, or perhaps Peter, Peter Renman as well, so to, to have things that will look like a bit the kinetic theory, but in case where maybe you cannot apply the, the standard one, right? So that are a bit our goal. So let's, let me try to draw the, the sort of overall picture of, of what I'm talking. So I, I imagine that I have a very, very standard setup, if you wish. So you have an integrable Hamiltonian that will be more than integrable this morning. It will be a free system. And then you, you have a term that will break integrability, which uh, in, imagine the perturbation. And so I imagine that the, this parameter lambda is smaller than any energy scale in the system in some sense. OK? And what, what kind of picture can you have? Well, first of all, there is a small transient time, which is a for the one in, in some units, right? So I only, I only scale things with respect to lambda here. So you have a first transient time where the, the system will ramp up to the, to the GGE, where it is, the, it is described as, as we heard this morning, right? This, we can imagine that this goes on a time scale which is sort of fast, okay? And once you, are, you arrive there, uh, usual kinetic theory could apply, and that means that now you will relax Things observable will start to relax on a, on a time scale uh, lambda minus two. And typically, the story ends after this, this vertical line, right? So what happens is that this, this would be the thermal, the thermal value would be reached after this time. Um, so in this talk, there is a third, a third step that is usually non-present, right? So in fact, what you reach is not the thermal value, but pre-thermal value, what I would call pre-thermal value, which is somehow much simpler state than the, the full GGE, but has an extra, has extra conserved quantity with respect to the real thermal state, right? And then on much longer time scales, Shing should decay again towards the thermal thing, right? On a scale that I write as lambda minus 2p for p larger than one, so it's just a larger time scale than this one, and one of the goals of the talk would be to understand what kind of scales Appear. So to, to sort of substantiate this picture in a concrete example and try to understand what are the time scales, right? So here, I mean, here I think of local observables. So a small difference with, with quantum case is that uh, if, if it's a quantum system, I think you could take all really local. Uh, but for classical system, there is no self-averaging, I think. So you, you should take a sum of local terms for this picture to make sense. But, but besides, for this difference, I think it, the picture is not different. OK. Sorry, yeah.
Yeah, but it's much simpler than the previous one. It's, it's a, instead of having infinitely many, you, you're back to finite number, okay? And this finite number will relax to one at the end of the day, okay? Well, okay, so that, that's the, the model that I study, which is a popular one, which is uh, a little bit like this Fermi pasta Ulam Tsingu model is the same. So a classical chain of oscillators as we had in the talk by Stefano. So you are four terms in the Hamiltonian, so you have the uh, kinetic energy. Uh, then you have harmonic pinning, which has those pinning which are here. Obviously, you see it's, it's one dimensional, and if you think that that is to be des describing the, the phonon field of, a, of, of some material, then putting pinning is not a very natural thing to do. But since it's one dimensional, it avoids a lot of complications that are otherwise would arise, and so you should think that as a toy model and not as a realistic model for phonon in a solid, I would think. Although maybe this could apply to also perhaps realistic things, but I didn't. Okay, so you have this harmonic pinning, then you have harmonic interaction among the oscillators, and uh, finally there is an unharmonic coupling, which is the interaction among the harmonic modes that will uh, completely modify the picture, right? So we can take unit where this omega naught, uh, this, this frequency omega naught is one, to, just to eliminate one letter, and uh, there are two, two sort of things that you should remember, right? What is this delta, which is this harmonic coupling, and the other one is lambda, which is this unharmonic coupling, okay? And I look at the thing in the regime where this lambda is very, very small, okay? Good. Um, so it's, I meant it's classical, so classical means just the system will be described by Newton's equation uh, that you have here. And uh, for stability reason, we will ask that delta is between zero and zero five, and then lambda is positive, that means that when all oscillators are at rest, it's the stable fixed point. Okay, so that's a small condition. And then the thing which is very simple, sort of, is uh, when lambda is equal zero, you get a purely harmonic system. So it's a, it's a classical phonon field, and that's more than integrable, it's a free system, so you get H0 is omega k, a k square, and those, all those modes evolve, all the eigen modes of the system evolve uh, independently. And this is the dispersion relation omega. And a thing that one may already notice is that when delta, so when the strength of the harmonic coupling go to zero, this band will get flatter and flatter. And that, that will play an, a role in the explanation that I will develop later on, okay? But here's the picture, okay. Um, now you add the interaction. Well, the V may be expand in those eigenmode bases. You can think of them as, so let, let it's like, Creation annihilation, right? Although it's classical, but let's still maybe think like this. And um, it, it is not a theorem, but, but somehow it is presumably so that the energy is the only conserved quantity of the system in the thermodynamic limit. And in particular, a thing that I would call the number of phonons, which is this quantity, is not preserved. It's not a, it's not a conserved quantity of the full Hamiltonian. So if you take terms here where you have, for example, three creations and one annihilation, then you will that would destroy the conservation of this N0, okay? And why do I insist on this example of this being non-conserved? Well, because this will be, this number of phonon will be the reason why there will be this long preterm plateau at the end of the day. So it is not conserved, but it will be pseudo-conserved for a very long time, that, that is what will happen. Okay, so a small remark for, for those of you who would not get used to this. I mean, those things are expressed in Fourier variables, right? So, uh, one usually thinks of, at least me, in real variables, so in real space. So if you have an observable A, which is written like this, uh, where phi is analytic, then it means that it is a sum of quasi-local terms. So the, the AX and A dagger Y, they are quasi-local. And if it's analytic, it means that this decays exponentially. So, so uh, in particular, this number of phonons, uh, which might look a bit unnatural from if you think in real space, is just also a sum of local quantities. Bon. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. So, so okay, yes, here it's, I took for, for writing r equal four. So I, I will say why I, I took considered, I could have considered only r equal four. It, it induced interaction among the phonons, um, but in CD, the self potential. Uh, so I, I took both uh, nonlinearity to be four and six for reason that uh, I hope will come clear. Okay, good. So so um, so the first thing is this GGE ensemble. What what it looks like in this case? Well, uh, so if you assume that your initial state is translation invariant, uh, n as zero average, 
then uh, so it will stay on as time evolves, and uh, the conserved quantities are all the AK, the, all the energy of each mode, and you move to a Gaussian ensemble, which is this one, which is the generalized Gibbs ensemble in this case. So you, and then it has a special name in this case, right? Because the, this WK, which is the, the variance of each mode, if you wish, is called the Wigner function. Okay, well, that, that would be the, so it is a much, much simpler GGE than the one that we had this morning, right? It's a sort of a trivial one. Okay, good. So uh, now we put in the interaction, and uh, the picture that emerged from this Boltzmann Pyrrhus description is that on a time scale lambda minus two, thing will, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the, the conserved quantity of the GGE will start evolving. Okay, and uh, it's a bit like the fact that you get lambda minus two, it's like, it is called kinetic time scale, and it obviously in quantum setup would perhaps be called Fermi Golden Rule, but, but here I don't use this terminology. So let me give, uh, I mean, that, that has been studied much more intensively than what is on this slide, but let, let me give sort of flavor of the reason why you should think that this lambda minus two is correct. Uh, the main reason, I guess, is that so if you see how, how the current, how those things evolve with time, well, they don't evolve if there is no uh, V, if there is no perturbation, so it's all, of order lambda. But the remarkable thing is that this current, J, uh, averages to zero in any GG state root zero, okay? And so if you assume that after some time, the, the, the distribution uh, is like row zero, which was this GGE, times a correction, which is one plus something of order lambda. Well, then you directly come that the derivative in time of uh, this, this quantity is of order lambda squared times the coefficient, okay? But there is more to it, because this coefficient, you can, this, this correction F1, you can actually determine. Why? Because uh, since they evolve only on, on order lambda square, that means that uh, in your correction to the GGE, this must be time independent. And when you express that, you find a relation for this correction, and this relation allows you to determine this as a number. So if I give you sort of the, uh, the Wigner function, well, you can compute the, the coefficient, how, how, how that decays, right? And usually, that is not the way people write it down. They write it down as a Boltzmann equation for phonons. So, this, this is how it looks like. So they say, instead of looking at those conserved quantity, let's look how the GGE himself, itself will evolve. And uh, what you get is that you get that the Wigner function, which is now time dependent, will indeed evolve for the lambda square times a collision kernel, which involves four or six phonons, depending whether the V was Q to the power four or two to the power six. And uh, well, high order corrections, obviously, right? Okay. And this has been, I mean, there, there, are, there have been much more studies than the, the sort of very sketchy derivation that I was giving, right? So the, uh, well, by Herbert Spohn, uh, Jan Jovdusi, uh, Raphael Lefebvre, and many, many other people, I think. Okay. So that's, that's the thing. I, I don't know whether it's fully understood, but at least, at least it's a well-accepted well picture, I think, that, that the things go like this. Okay. So now comes an accident. Uh, what is the accident that could be, right, that the rate that, that I was telling uh, could just vanish once in a while, right? I mean, after all, that's possible. Uh, there could be some, uh, the rate can be zero, so, so that's, that's a possibility. And uh, what turns out is that uh, if you take the Q4 nonlinearity, uh, how the number of phonons decays is in all the lambda square is just zero in, in the GGEs that you can have. So, in whatever GGE, actually, okay? So, so that means that this quantity will not decay on kinetic time scales. And then the question is, well, when, when would that eventually start decaying, if not then, okay? So two, a question that one may obviously wonder is, uh, how generic is that, I mean? So it's not fully generic in the sense that uh, if instead of QX4 nonlinearity, you take QX6, then it's not true, at least if the, the delta, that is the parameter of the harmonic interaction, is not too small, then actually it is not true that this coefficient is zero. It's, an, it's a positive number, okay? Uh, also, what you could do is to take a dis different dispersion relation that would coincide, for example, in, instead of nearest neighbors, you take other kind of more neighbors than just nearest neighbors. You can engineer another dispersion relation omega k, such that this coefficient will not be zero. 
However, it is still a little bit generic in the sense that if delta, if the, the parameter, the, let's say the, the, the harmonic coupling, the harmonic hopping term is small, then it will always eventually become zero, even with different dispersion religions. Okay? Yes? No, 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 no. So you see, for example, uh, it's independent. So you see for Q6 uh, interaction and the same omega k, the threshold is 0 0.3. It's, it's approximately 0 0.3. This is from numerical value. So if it was zero, if you take 0 0.2, it will it will actually be zero. So it, no, I mean it independently. Uh, no, I. So, uh, no, it, it does not. So, so, so the, the, well, I, the, the assumption was that uh, you start with something that is, it, well, translation invariant and uh, zero average. So that, that is, uh, I, okay, boom. Uh, if you don't take translation invariant, then you add extra complications, but, it, but let's not discuss this. But otherwise, you, uh, the, the expectation is that you have moved after a, a relatively short time towards the GGE. And then, uh, for whatever GGE you put, this is zero. So it's not a specific to some GGE, right? So the, it, 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 right. Assuming this to be correct, right? And you, you, could, you could discuss this assumption that you have indeed moved towards the GGE, but if, if that is correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and so we, so after a time, lambda minus two, we expect that the preternal Hamiltonian will not be any more uh, complicated GGE, but a, a GGE with essentially two quantities, right? Energy and uh, number of phonons or something. It's a bit sketchy the way I write, it's something slightly, slightly uh, different than this, but somehow something like this, okay. Um, so before that, that, that I move to trying to explain a bit the phenomenology, let, let me, this, this was pure theory, right? So perhaps you would like to see a plot that it, the theory is correct, at least so far, okay? So that's not my numerics, that's numerics by uh, Christian Mendel, uh, uh, Lou and Lukarinen. And what they did is they start with an initial uh, Wigner function which is really very much out of equilibrium. Uh, and uh, they just time evolved this Wigner function with some small lambda and they see what happens, okay? And what do they find is uh, that, so for very, for short times, the, it, it is not very well described by Boltzmann equation, the evolution, but soon it becomes. And so they start after a time 500, and you have the description by, so the, that is how the Boltzmann equation evolves, and that is how the real dynamics evolves. And uh, initially the, the matching is perfect because it is imposed, but uh, then the matching is a little bit less perfect, but still pretty accurate. And as you see, there is a clear difference between real equilibrium and preterm equilibrium. So the, the kinetic equilibrium is uh, this, this black dotted curve that the system goes close to. Real equilibrium is this red dotted curve. So for a, it's not the same beta, actually. It's the beta such that the energy match. Uh, and this is pretty much different for a time which is here 10,000. And in this experiment, the kinetic time scale would be 1,000. So that means after 10 times kinetic time scale still is pretty different from what equilibrium actually is, right? And notice that this difference is lambda independent again, right? So it's a, it's a, a big difference even when lambda will go to zero. It's a noticeable difference even when lambda go to zero. Okay. Um, so to, to get some understanding of, of why that is, this, this, this story, I think it is simple to imagine that the phonons are quantized. They are not, but, but later I will say why the explanation why, why this heuristic for quantized phonons carries over to non-quantized phonons, okay? Well, you have to think of the following, right? So that in, when, when it's in this regime, lambda go to zero, the only process that can have some impact on the long-term dynamics are resonant processes. All the, that, that means the one that preserves this H zero energy, all of the process would lead only essentially to oscillations, right? And the other thing is that, as I told you, the, the energy band of the free system narrows as delta goes to zero. But that means that it's, it needs higher order process to create, you can only create two phonons at a time, but it needs, I mean, 
you see if those arrows, the arrows that, so you will, you will sort of create low energy phonons and destroy a bit less of high energy phonons, but you need them, at, at the end your energet, energetic balance needs to be zero, that's the condition of being resonant. And for, I mean, if the, if the band is narrow, then the, the difference in size between the arrow on the right and the arrow on the left is a small difference, and then you need a very high order process to achieve this stuff, okay? And that's why you, you need to go in higher order perturbation theory to see the destruction of the number of phonons, if it were quantized. Okay. So, as I told, uh, you can translate this into, uh, into higher order in your perturbation expansion, and you have to take account another constraint, which is translation invariance. That means that in all the terms, the sum over the case needs to be zero. That's, that's obvious, right? And uh, so that a small miracle is that four order term uh, never are able to satisfy the above constraints. So to have translation invariance and uh, energy balance to be zero. And then if delta is between 0, 3 and 0, 5, you have six order term are able to do it. If delta is even a bit smaller, I mean, as delta goes to zero, the band narrows, right? So you need higher and higher the process. Then you need uh, between 0, 26, 0, 3, you need eight order process, and it goes on and on like this. So the Sort of the thing to remember is not all those numbers, but that as delta goes to zero, you need one over that I mean process of order one over delta to achieve creation of destruction of phonons. Okay. And so this can immediately be translated into uh, what power in lambda you need to, to have uh, non-conservation of the number of phonons. So for Q6 at high at high delta, it just the order lambda that will do the job, and that's why you do see it in kinetic theory. Uh, for, for, for lambda from QX4, you need already a second order process here, that's why you don't see it in kinetic theory. And then you can fill in the table and uh, find what order in perturbation will guarantee that you get uh, dissipation of the number of phonons. But I would like to draw the attention on the fact that the, the powers that are here, one, two, three, this is not yet the power of the instantaneous dissipation rate. It is the order in perturbation, but there will be some further cancellation that will make that the rate is not exactly, is not, is related to those numbers, it's not equal to those numbers. Uh, okay, so let me move on. So I, I want now to make some uh, rigorous result out of this, and I got inspiration from work that we did with uh, Dima Abanin, uh, Wojciech, and one way. And this was for Fermi Hubbard models. It was a quantum model. And uh, you had, when, when you have, a, in the Fermi Hubbard model, when the interaction energy is much higher than the hopping energy, it's very, very difficult to destroy uh, those doublons. And that means the number of doublons is almost conserved. And actually, the, the, the strategy was to perform a canonical change of variable, or if you prefer, a unitary uh, transformation, so that h is moved to h tilde, and so that the commutator of h tilde with number of doublons becomes exponentially small in uh, u of j. Okay, and I will here mimic the strategy in the classical setup, and I can formulate results on this. Okay, so one way to formulate the result is that uh, there exists indeed a canon, for, for, for small lambda, there is, exists a canonical transformation that I call, that I represent here by this, so that H tilde is a canonically transformated of H, so that the commutator becomes Poisson bracket, H tilde commuted with N0 is of order lambda to the P, where P is the exponent that was featuring in those tables. So if it's one, then there is not need for a theorem because it's obvious, but for two, three, it, and so on, it, it, it starts being used. Okay, uh, that's, that can be phrased as a theorem, although, with a word of caution, namely that uh, as, as the volume increase, you need lambda smaller and smaller to get the convergence, uh, or at least it's not that you need it, but I, I cannot guarantee that you don't need it. And um, moreover, the locality, how local is this H tilde is not, is not clear. And that's why it, it's a very useful way of thinking, but uh, it's not the best way of formulating the result at the end. So what, what you better do is to go back to original variables and uh, Let's say you, you go back to the same age, but now you, you, you rotate back the N0, which become a, a dress version of N0, which I, I know I call N, right, which is this one. And you, you truncate it at some point, so that you get this relation, that age commutator with, the, the original age commutator with N is lambda to the power P. And uh, sort of this, 
this has no issue of what happens in the large volume limit. I mean, eventually, to check this relation uh, amounts to some algebra. I mean, you can, you can check it algebraically, that, that, that's just fine, right? Um, and uh, although I think that the, the, the best, I could not find the algebra without going through this step, but at the end, you can check it through algebra. Okay, so there is no analysis hidden here. And as I told you, the power of P will grow like one over delta if delta goes to zero, delta being this harmonic, harmonic coupling. Okay, uh, so two, two perhaps small remarks on what that means, exactly this thing. Um, I, no, no, for, first perhaps the most important, why is it that this, the intuition developed in the, the quantum model applies in fact to the classical model? Well, when you try to make this theorem, eventually what you find is that what matters is that uh, those sort of uh, commutation relations are the important thing. So, and you realize that if you change the Poisson bracket by the usual uh, commutator, they obey exactly the same relation as, as the creation and annihilation operators would, would, would obey. And that's why, I mean, you, the spectrum is discrete of this operator, right? So even though it's not quantized in sort of physical sense, although I even don't know what that means, but uh, this, this relation still, still is correct, right? And then uh, maybe what does it mean to be for Hn to be of order lambda to the p when it means if it, that Hn is lambda to the p times a polynomial that can be described like this, and where the function is analytic, which means that it is still sum of local terms, okay? So we have control on the locality. Okay. And now comes the next part, and out of, out of this theorem, I would like to extract the rates. So, so uh, and I will mimic exactly what, what I, the scheme that I proposed for the how to derive the, this Boltzmann equation for phonons, I will mimic exactly the strategy and find some answer, okay? So I want to find that the, 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 time, the time scale of the discrete ML plateau are lambda minus two. So how does that proceed? When I assume that the state is this discrete ML state, so you see there is a small difference with respect to what I was saying initially, that it's not H zero that features here, it's H tilde, so the ones that has been constructed. And I assume that it's, a, this state times a small correction, which is of order lambda to the p, okay? And um, if, if we do that, then uh, we notice that, uh, the thing to notice is that the, the current um, in the, in the pre-thermal state, so the same thing as for kinetic, kinetic equation, the current, the average of the current of N0 in the pre-thermal state vanishes. So I will be able to apply the same Algebra sort of, and what it yields is that if you now compute the current of N0 in the real state, the first term is uh, two lambda to the 2p times a coefficient. And again, by the same logic, we can say, aha, but if it's so slow, then that means that this correction that was here must be stationary. You express it and you find uh, an expression for it. And at the end, it looks something familiar, right? It looks that what is this rate is lambda to the 2p times a sort of current-current correlator. So, so it looks like what, would, what you would obtain from linear response formalism, which is a bit a posteriori, you could think it's okay because we, we are in the case where currents vanish. So you, you, get, you get this sort of expression. And the nice thing is that despite the fact that my GGE was defined for H tilde, which was a rotated one, if I'm only interested in the lowest order term, I can replace the dynamics inside this current-current correlator by the, really the free dynamics, the initial free dynamics. So that means that this, this number here can be entirely computed. So this, sorry, I, I forgot, uh, there is a small typo here. So uh, this tau, it is a limit for tau going to infinity. So this is a regularization of the time integral. Uh, and I take the limit of this regularization to go, to, I mean, tau, tau is going to infinity. That means that you, it's, it's as if you erase eventually this, this regularization for the matrix. Okay, and I did not recognize entirely, but I think that those kind of formula agree with the formula that you can find in this paper by uh, Malaya and company. Okay, okay now maybe we can have numerical check of this. Uh, <clears throat> so how, how do we proceed? Uh, I start with an initial state which is sort of close to, a, to the preterminal state uh, for some beta and the mu, the, the chemical potential, is minus one, and that means that it is, frankly, out of equilibrium, right? I mean, uh, equilibrium means mu equals zero, and here I have mu equal minus one, so there's an out of equilibrium. Okay. 
So if you time evolve, what, what will you observe, for example, here for some value of parameters that, okay, you start here and hops, it goes fast, and then it goes to the thermal value. So this is uh, N0 over L, so the, the density of phonons. Density of phonons goes to its thermal value after some time. Uh, but to, to check with the rate, you will not look at this full expression. You will zoom, or I will, I zoom here, and when I zoom this small part on the left, this small corner, I get this. And what do I observe? I do first observe a very short ink, which probably means that you, the, the system runs to the, to the pre-thermal state. And then you get something that looks a bit linear. And this, this linear slope, I will say that is the rate that I want to compare with my theory. Okay? Okay. Uh, let's first try with the, uh, a case that appears to be safe, namely a case that is described by kinetic theory. Um, so that means Q, the linearity is Q to the 6, and delta is 0 to 35, so that it, it is the usual, the rate of dissipation is the usual lambda square. And the nice thing about the expression that we have is that we can compute the, de the explicit dependence in the beta, where beta is not the final temperature, it is the, it is the temperature of this initial state that sits here, okay? Okay, so you see uh, there is pretty good matching at beta equal 1. You can also, for, for, for lambda that go to Pretty, pretty small number. Uh, you can also test the beta minus 5 dependence. Let's do this. So here's how it looks. So you, for lambda equal 10 to minus 3, this is the beta dependent that is observed. Okay. Now let's, let's go to a case which, so this didn't need a new theory to, to, uh, be, to be found. I mean, this follows from usual kinetic theory. Uh, let's look at Q4 nonlinearity, which then we predict a decay rate that goes like lambda to the 4. So uh, and for beta equal 1, for example, we see that when, when lambda becomes small, it seems to be, to be good, actually. Um, and we can also check, it's again the beta minus 5 dependent that appears. And that also seems to be reasonably, reasonably well uh, realized, okay? Now, uh, let me be honest, there is a case that goes uh, less, less nicely. So, uh, let's take uh, Q, Q6 uh, nonlinearity with delta 28, that means that uh, this, this was chosen small enough to be non-kinetic, so it's predicted to be lambda to the power 4, and the beta dependence is minus 9, turns out to be like this. And you see the theory and the data do not really agree, right? I mean, the, the, you have, the data are fitted here by, a, by something which is lambda 3.6, and the theory tells that it must be lambda to the 4, and there is a, a, big, a big gap sort of between them. So two possibilities, right? One is that theory is not correct. Uh, and I will comment on why that could, in fact, be a possibility. Uh, other option is what happens is that those two lines, right? This, this line is a bit steeper than this one, and they will eventually cross at some point here. That is not accessible through my numerics. And so eventually, it would just mean that you just need a much smaller lambda to get rid of all finite size effects that you encounter. So it would be possible, but uh, so the, the two scenarios are still alive here, OK? The same conclusion comes if you uh, put the dependence on beta. You see that there is, uh, I mean, instead of beta 9, the fit is rather beta minus 8, and things do not agree pretty well, right? So le let me mention, uh, and I think that is at, uh, somehow at the variance with some previous work uh, on the topic, uh, why, one reason why I don't completely trust uh, the theory. So the main assumption sort of was that the state after time t was essentially pre thermal state times a correction which needs to be of order lambda to the p. Okay, so and if it's not lambda to the p, then the theory collapses. Okay, now <clears throat> let's, let, let's try to at least check whether that is, I cannot prove the, the hypothesis, but let's try to, to see whether it, it seems to make sense or not, right? So let me compare two velocities. So one thing is through this theory, we predict that the thermodynamical parameter that sit in the pre-thermal state vary at a rate lambda to the power 2p. Um, and on the other hand, um, we have relaxation towards the pseudo-equilibrium. So, so that is, v1 is how the pre-thermal state moves, and v2 is how, uh, according, if that is correct, how the real state try, try to uh, stick to the pre-thermal state. Sort of. okay? And uh, this is from kinetic processes times the distance, which is lambda to the p. And so for, for things to go fine, we would need that 
uh, V1 is smaller than V2, so that you, you converge faster to the, to the, uh, um, to the pretermal state, then the pretermal state is flowing. So I, I found three cases for uh, when you are in the case uh, P equal one, uh, this doesn't work, so it, it is the opposite. But it's reassuring, because uh, if P equal one, that means it's kinetic, and if it's kinetic, uh, there is no reason that the pretermal state would be only uh, described by two quantities there. We, we know that there are plenty of other of them. So it's a good sign that it did not work in that case. But, but still, obviously, then the, the rate for gamma will still be good. I mean, the, the lambda square behavior will still be correct for other reasons, though with a different prefactor. The KSP equal two was the one that I analyzed in numerics and appears to be marginal, okay? So uh, the two velocities are a bit similar, so it is not clear that this theory is fine. Luckily for P larger than two, uh, it's, it's okay. V1 is parametrically smaller than V2, so I tend to trust more the theory in this case. Unfortunately, uh, this corresponds to such small rates that uh, they were not accessible in numerics, so uh, that's a bit the, the pity of, of, of this story. So, uh, it's, I think my time is over. Um, so I think we get some new example of pre and a sort of one possible ex expansion of the formalism of kinetic theory to other kind of setup. Okay, thank you very much. In the beginning, you said something that the observable O in classical case could be special, somehow of a different type than in the quantum case, right? Well, I think the, so I, in the, I mean, when you have this picture on, in the quantum case, I think if you just take a, a local observable, you will see that it goes to a, to a constant value as, as course of time, right? But, but if you take classical system, you, you will still see oscillations of this. So it's, it's, not, it's not really averaging, right? So the, the, to get an average, you should, for example, do some spatial averaging. So this N0 that you're speaking yeah, about, one specific observable, so what is it in real space, actually? Oh, it's, it's, it's a sum of local terms, or quasi-local terms. So can you say what it is? The formula, you mean? Yeah, it's a sum of local things. It's, it's something like this, right? So, so uh, x and y, then you get some kernel, which is exponentially decaying, and then you get It does not depend on R. Um, no, no, because it's it's a, it's the it's the bare quantity. The N zero is the bare quantity, so this, this will not. But then, obviously, if you if you compute the, the so that that is the thing that is not that is conserved. That if you if you want to to not take the N zero, but the the thing that is really pseudo conserved, then you will add corrections that will depend on R. Yes, yes. So you're saying that you're looking then at an observable that depends on R. Well, it depends because if you if you so the the bare thing does not right because the bare thing is independent of the perturbation. But if you add the perturbation, and if you compute this this uh, so this would uh, strictly speaking only be conserved or the lambda. No, I wanted to say I want to have something conserved or the lambda squared. Then I need to add some term there to make it conserved. And this term will depend on the potential that was there. So it will indeed depend on whether r was four or six or you could take other numbers. Somehow, if I take my generic observable in real space for this first harmonic oscillators, I'm pretty sure that I will not have this um, pre no, no, but, but I, I, you, no, no, in the opposite, quite the opposite, because the, the all observables will inherit from this, because the, you will move to a pre-thermal state that will that will be sort of that will feel that will feel the, the conservation. So, for typical local observables, you you will you will observe those this this figure with two plateaus. I didn't understand it. No, no, but so, so indeed it could be confusing. I mean, the, the, there is only one quantity that, that, was, that was sort of not destroyed during the kinetic processes. But then you move to a state which is not the thermal state. So you, you, you move to a, instead of the Gibbs state, you have an extra conserved quantity in the, in the final, in the state, in the pre-thermal state. So the, all other observables, will move to the average with respect to this state, okay. which is different. So that, that you will observe the difference for typical observables. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? I had a similar question, maybe. So if I look at uh, 
initial conditions which are for example a step process this oscillator chain you want to take it a non translation right. invariant right yeah, yeah then of course i know it should just follow the diffusion equation oh, yeah, yeah yeah because this this will and still then, and the thermalization is just given by the diffusion constant and i don't see where this like the pre -thermal, i mean i won't see anything like well i mean if if you if you look at large you take a thermodynamic limit of of the system and you you consider this step profile this will be if if lambda is non infinitesimal uh, I mean, you fix lambda and then take thermodynamic limit. This will be a, a short process, a short thing. I mean, the, you, you will. I mean, it, it's, it, it's even if it scale like lambda to the minus thousand, it will still be a small time scale compared to the real thermodynamic limit, sort of. So, so uh, I don't. Well, it, it could have some. I don't think you would you would observe it very much. On those macro, uh, if you really rescale time and space, I, I don't think you would, you would. It's a transient phenomenon uh, with a, a, a finite duration. Last, it lasts a finite time eventually. Uh, okay, so if there are no other questions, let's thank uh, Francois. Thank you.